All right, let's get started. Uh, thank you for joining us on CRISPR Office Hours uh, as we do this every Thursday. And we're really excited as it's season four, episode three. For the past few months, uh, for folks who've been joining us on a regular basis, we've been hosting CRISPR Office Hours as a way for the scientific community to connect with one another that it gets questions answered and you can tackle the pandemic together. And we've had great panelists, guests on the show to talk about their experiences, their research, and how they are tackling either COVID-19 or just working and getting back into the lab and how the pandemic has affected them. So we're really excited that we are able to have great guests on the show and continue that trend. And a few housekeeping items. As always, CRISPR Office Hours is recorded and you can watch previous episodes and this episode on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Synthigo. And we ask everyone to mute themselves and use the chat window to send in your questions. We really wanna make this as interactive as possible because that's why we started CRISPR office hours as a way for the genome engineering community to talk with one another and support one another through this. So please send in your questions, send in your comments and thoughts and our guest panelists and Kevin and myself will try to answer them as much as many of them as we can. So with that being said, my name is Aditya Vempati, and I'm the VP of Marketing at Synthigo, and I'm really excited to host another CRISPR Office Hours with my partner in crime, Kevin Holden. Hey, Aditya, and welcome, everyone, to uh, another exciting episode of CRISPR Office Hours. I'm your co-host, Kevin Holden, Head of Science at Synthigo, and the title for Office Hours this week is CRISPR-Cas13 Optimization in Vivo. All right, so our mantra over the past few months here at Synthigo has been to keep calm and carry on, but our version of it is to keep calm and CRISPR on. So please stick around until the end of today's episode as once again, we'll tell you how to get your hands on a special edition keep calm and CRISPR on t-shirt. And uh, as our producer Bobby tells us, these are now shipping out um, to all of our viewers and listeners and friends. So uh, keep an eye out for those in the mail. Great, Kevin. So really excited to introduce our panelist guest today, Miguel Moreno Mateos. Miguel is actually a principal investigator at the Adolosan Center of Development Biology, CABD in Salvia, Spain. Miguel, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much, Aditya and Kevin for uh, the invitation. So happy to be here. Great. So. Not sure if you know, Miguel, I'm, uh, if you've been watching a few of our episodes, I think you may have. We like to start off with a poll question to keep people engaged, right. make sure that they, you know, a little icebreaker to get us all in the conversation here. And so today's poll question for us is COVID-19 changed the world. What changes would you like to see continue post pandemic? So our options, continue wearing yoga pants all day, every day. Uh, People who can now work from home anywhere in the world, no commute. I like that one a lot, cuts down my time. Other people have to stay six feet away from me. No more personal space uh, invaders. Pretty sure there's a few there. Hunting for toilet paper. I'm, I'm gonna pass on that one. And then drive by birthday celebrations, which is pretty cool actually, I've seen a lot of those. And then the last one, every restaurant is now to go. So if our audience wants to chime in with what they uh, want to see continue post pandemic, that'd be great. Miguel, what do you care about? What do you want to see stick around after this? I don't know. I think I'm going to go for hunting for toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that was fun. That was fun. <laughs> that's fun for you, huh, Miguel? Okay, great. <laughs> right. You know, in, in, in Spain, we, we, don't, we don't do this um, six feet away from me. So we are so touchy. So I think the three one is not an option for Spaniards, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Kevin? Um, well, I'm, I'm not really partial to, to yoga pants uh, myself, but um, I, I have been wearing shorts every day, all day. So maybe we, maybe, maybe we can change that. Um, but uh, actually, you know, really, I like the idea that now people can work from home um, and not have to commute, if you're, you know, especially if you're not in the lab, so I think that's going to change things. I'd like to see that continue, and uh, you know, maybe that's going to make everything better for everyone in terms of like housing equity and commute equity. Let's put it that way. Oh, that's a good way to think about it. Um, 
for me, I got to go with number two, as you said, Kevin, too. work anywhere, uh, can work from home or anywhere in the world. I think uh, cutting down my commute every day by two hours is a, is a wonderful gift. We got a pretty funny answer from Ian Fielding. Uh, he says, come to the UK for toilet paper. They have lots. <laughs> it looks like a, it looks like a lot of people are selecting uh, number two. I'm seeing a lot of number two in here. Um, yeah. Couple of number, couple of number sixes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're seeing a, seeing a array of where people don't have to interact with other humans as much. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, 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 number two is great if you don't have kids, right? <laughs> it, otherwise, it's a little bit more complicated, I would say. But yeah, it's great too. I mean, working from home, of course. Number oh, yeah. three, uh, number three is good. Around. I think number three is great for the introverts too. That's good. <laughs> space space <laughs> yeah. all right all right thank you for all the interaction guys and the responses and uh we'll get started now all right so we're very excited to have miguel on today and you know miguel uh, we really appreciate him joining us uh from spain uh from sevilla today where it's a little after 6 p.m local time yep um yep. so so let's get started Right. So yeah, yeah, Miguel, thanks for taking time to join us today. Before we dive in, um, I just want to say it's been a real pleasure getting to know you and following your work over the last four years. Um, I think we actually met at the Genome Engineering Conference at Cold Spring Harbor back in that's 2016. Correct. Yeah, that's yeah back, then, back then you were at Yale University. Can you tell us a little bit about where you're working now uh, back in your home country and what makes it a really special place to work? Yeah, well, to be honest, at the end, um, um, comparing Spain with the U.S. is for science is kind of a, a hard comparison because you know the money that you, is invested in, in Spain is much less. Unfortunately, you know we are now in Spain having even strikes, you know, uh, Twitter strikes for you know demanding more more funding, and you know and now they have the opportunity to say it loudly here. Uh, you know, it's like in a, the hashtag is no science in the future basically in Spanish. Sin ciencia no hay futuro. And um, of course, I didn't come back for, you know, that reason, let's say. At the end, you come back to your home because you have your family here. I got a kid and uh, I wanted to come back home to raise her with, you know, my, you know, grandparents, cousins, uncles, aunties. But say that, I think in Spain, in any case, we do a great science too. With the, I, I think that with the better funding, we could do it even greater. And um, I have the pleasure and the privilege to be in a fantastic institute for amazing scientists, top scientists in Europe and internationally speaking as well. And um, yeah, that they are supporting me, are helping me in this first and a half year that I have, I am running the lab. And it has been a great experience to be back in Spain. And the lab is working great, to be honest, much better than I thought at the beginning. <laughs> because the transition was a little bit hard, but uh, yeah, so happy. Um, um, I think um, definitely with uh, in Spain we, we we are able to do good science. In, in my institute, in particular, we are doing great science too. Um, I hope that the, the government get the message too, and uh, and we get more funding from the from the Spanish government, and uh, we do it. We can do it even better. So, you, so your institute is focused on developmental uh, biology, yes. and um, it's also part of university, correct? Exactly. So it's like in, um, in Spain, we have a um, um, research institute that can be associated to the university, but they, they can be also associated to the Spanish Research Council, which is uh, like in a, our uh, organisms in terms of science in Spain, let's say. No? So in, in particular, CABD is a, it's an, um, mix institute between the Spanish Research Council and the University of Pablo de la Vida, which is the one that I belong to. So great. Uh, Miguel, I got a question. Can you tell us a little bit more of the graphic that you have here? Yeah, this is actually, I'm trying to, this graph has been done in a Star Wars Institute, which is the institute in Kansas that I am collaborating with, um, uh, basically with the Bazzini lab, Ariel Bazzini lab, which is uh, the other lab involved in this catheter project in vivo. And this um, cartoon was made there. And it's trying to show what I think we have been able to do, which is basically um, uh, degrade the RNA in an in vivo system as it is zebrafish. Here with a, 
scissor, we are cutting those uh, fishes and appear in this, uh, in the other uh, uh, side, the RNA cut, let's say. You know, it's, a, it's kind of summarizing what I'm going to talk about today a little bit. Cool. So um, actually, before we get into that, and as we move on to the next slide, Miguel, can you, can you tell us how COVID-19 situation has affected your ability to participate in and organize scientific conferences this year? Oh, definitely. I think you, the next slide is going is, is to, it's a nice summary of that, actually, because um, uh, you, you, you put the, ne the next slide, please. It's um, a summary slide of, of your question. So this year we had two amazing meetings that I was so excited to attend. The first one was organized by essentially Eduard Malagatillo in Peru, and it was the Latin American Civil Beach, uh, Network meeting. It was uh, this is uh, the annual um, meeting. So the last time was in Mexico. Four years ago was in Brazil, and I have been attending uh, over the last four or five years. And uh, this year was special because it was the 10th anniversary. Um, it was a fantastic meeting, um, and, and, a, and previously to the meeting, we got a, we had a Silverfish course. Which, uh, we, we were going to touch uh, you know, genomics, microscopy, gene editing, of course, and I was going to teach the gene editing course, uh, among other sponsors. Sintel was collaborating, sending gather names and stuff. I appreciate that. Thank you for that. And, but unfortunately, with the uh, COVID-19 situation, everything was, I mean, it was, Cancel actually. Hopefully, it will be happening in maybe 2021 or 2022. We, who knows? But I'm sure that um, Edward is absolutely convinced that the, this meeting should be should be happening in the future. And uh, yes, and, and you know, the, the meeting was in uh, in Cusco, which is an incredible city to visit. And we got, you know, basically. A, Super star speakers from Silverfish fish field. So, I mean, um, people all over the world, like Didier Stanier, um, Liliana Sonica Kressel, and, and top top scientists coming for for these meetings. And and the second one that I was pretty excited about it was the the one that I was organizing together with uh, Eric Sondheimer from Humans, and it was a a workshop on CRISPR Cas from touching from microbiology to biomedicine. It's, that's the, it's the title of the meeting. But again, was uh, canceled, um, postponed for 2029, 2029, 2029, sorry. And uh, that was going to be uh, in, in South Spain, in Baeza, um, in the, run by the University International University of Andalusia, which is the region where I'm, I'm working, the south of, of my country. Um, you know, this, um, the, the beauty of this uh, workshop is that it's only for um, 50 people, so the interaction with speakers is, is absolutely um, um, guaranteed. Um, we had uh, Francis Mojica opening up the, the session, and then, you know, this, you, can, you can read here the, the panel of Jim Kim, Jean Sukin, Kathleen Yakam, oh, no, Benjamin Klesteber, uh, people from Scott Wolf all over the world. The also top scientists, uh, to, uh, to my knowledge, the first international uh, CRISPR-Cas meeting in Spain, actually. So we were so excited. And now, you know, because the COVID game, we may, we, I, we, we have hopeness about uh, to do it in uh, 2021, in October or November, we'll see. Yeah, it's too bad that, uh, that, that, that had to be canceled for now, like, uh, yeah. like a lot of conferences that are going on. Um, yeah. Now, virtually, um, maybe that's an option. But if not, I think you said because it's 50 people, maybe exactly. be, it's going to be better exactly. to do it in person when we exactly. can. Exactly. So. Exactly. I All mean, right. they, were, they, were, they were thinking about it. And I, I was totally against that because, you know, this, the workshop is the, it's interaction with is mattering, actually, you know. And, and, you know, of course, the science, but, uh, you know, interaction with speakers and everybody. So, so, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about some of the CRISPR work then you've done in zebrafish in the past and yeah. why it's such a great model organism um, for yeah. you to do your research in? Yeah, yeah. Zebrafish is, um, I like it because um, um, for biotechnology, it's a uh, great organism because, um, you know, the, 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 the zebrafish can lay plenty of, uh, the couples can lay plenty of embryos, so then you can, you can actually run experiments in a very strained manner and in a very robust manner with plenty of embryos. And then that's why you can, um, in a fast manner, you know, optimize 
uh, technologies like CRISPR-Cas. And that, that was actually the, the idea uh, that uh, I had in mind when I joined the laboratory, uh, Antonio Giraldes lab in, at Yale University. Actually, I was going to work with another, my main project was a different one. And when I reached the laboratory, Antonio suggested to me to take a look to the CRISPR thing at that point back in 2013. Just why do you don't take a look to this CRISPR, CRISPR thing, you know, to see, if, you know, it's uh, worth it to digging. Uh, oh man, uh, that changed my life actually, <laughs> because it passed from the side project to the main project. And the first thing that we did was actually to generate an algorithm to predict gathering a activity or CRISPR-Cas9 activity in vivo. We were, you know, there are other people that have predicted the activity of, uh, of the system in, uh, based on data in mammalian cells culture. But, um, you know, in vivo, things are pretty much different. Um, we figure out some important difference between the predictions in, in, in ex vivo system, let's put it that way. So then we actually, after injecting thousands of gadolinates, we were able to, to generate a prediction model that we call a CRISPR scan, when uh, now it's run by the Giraldo's lab. And with that, we were able to, to actually validate our predictions in different organisms, not only in Zirovich, but also in Opus, for instance. And other people like in Maximilian Hausler in, in Santa Cruz, he was able to figure out that our system, our algorithm was the most efficient one predicted in vivo, also for mouse embryos. So that kind of, um, it was nice to see that the tool was, you know, uh, used in a, for the community, this because community in vivo. And then um, when we finish our optimization of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 in vivo, you know, FENSAM came out with this fantastic, fantastic new system, CRISPR-CPF1, now Cas12A, and uh, we tried to optimize it in, in also in zebrafish because it was, um, again, was working pretty nicely in um, mammalian cells and also in mouse. But then we found some troubles in, in, in zebrafish. One of them was that uh, we figured that the CRISPR RNA that was less uh, complex and less uh, than guide RNAs from Cas9, for instance. And, and uh, we figured that they were much more unstable that uh, we, have, we, we have seen it before with Cas9. So then we couldn't um, proceed with the normal um, um, approach that we, we used to have with Cas9. We normally inject in the embryo that I'm representing here, uh, the messenger RNA coding for Cas, Cas9 or whatever Cas, plus the guide RNA. In those conditions, the CRISPR uh, RNA for CPF1 was totally degraded. So then we figured that maybe by uh, having the proteins, we could um, make RMPs in vitro, then protect the uh, CRISPR RNA, and then get now um, um, activity. And that's what we are representing here on the left. So we here is an example of a gene involved implementation. And then when we did that, we were able to get, you know, mutants that are represented here by lack of pigmentation, okay? Those, those, those mutants uh, from mild to basically tyrosine in life, were are super severe. But then also we figured that the system was controlled by temperature, especially AES-CPF1. So then we did a uh, very simple experiment that was, um, well, I mean, we were suspecting that because the in vitro assays were telling us that uh, lower temperatures, the activity was uh, lower as well. And um, so then we did a very, nice and simple experiment that I love it. That was just to grow the fish in a higher temperature, the highest possible to, to, to be able to, to develop normally. And then as you can see here, we were targeting again tyrosinase when we grow the fish at 28 degrees. Uh, the system was unable to work properly. And then boom, we, we were able to see the lack of pigmentation just by increasing six degrees in the temperature. So that was um, kind of uh, my engagement with the CRISPR-Cas systems in vivo. In the in the Giraldo's lab, actually. Yeah, and then you, you started thinking about um, uh, looking at differentiation factors, right? For, for exactly development. Exactly. So the the point is uh, next slide. Then so the point is, um, can you uh, put the next slide, please? Yes, exactly. So in my laboratory, my former laboratory, the, um, the uh, we were studying the a process, a fundamental process in biology called the maternal to zygotic transition which is, um, is, a, is a um, common process in all animals where the maternal program, uh, maternal factors essentially are proteins and RNA from the mom in the oocyte, the oocyte in the oocyte, control the activation of the genome for the first time in our life. You, take, you need to think that uh, our genome is silent when 
the oocyte is fertilized, I need to be activated and transcribed for the first time in life. So those maternal factors are in charge of that. And then after that, the psychotic program starts and that um, uh, the embryo takes control of its own destiny, let's put it that way. And, and this psychotic program is able to promote uh, cell differentiation and different differentiation programs and also degrade the maternal contribution that's not necessary anymore. And the beauty of this uh, system is that it's an, uh, first of all, it's a, to me, it's a terrific question to, to be addressed because although we know something, I mean, we know a lot about that, but still there are plenty of questions that need to be addressed. It's also a very interesting system for uh, understanding pluripotency in vivo. You need to, you need to think that the, 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 the first hours after fertilization in zebrafish, for instance, that the, the, the psychotic gene activation occurs between two and three hours. So we are in a pluripotency state, but in vivo. It's an in vivo system in, in a pluripotency state. And that is trans, trans you know, it's like in a, in a transition to cell differentiation where we, we, we have this system also as a cell reprogramming uh, in vivo model as well. So, so it's like in a, with one particular system, we can understand this fundamental process in biology, maternal cell transition, but also pluripotency and cell uh, 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 reprogramming. So that, think, to me, is a great system. And uh, yeah, and then my lab, next slide, please. My, my, my lab um, was um, able to figure out that the pluri my former lab, I mean, <laughs> at the at Yale, I was able to figure out that this pluripotency factor, OX4, SOX3, and NANA were actually um, important for this psychotic genome activation to transcribe for first time our genome. And then we recently, um, in, um, in the last contribution from my part in my former lab, we figured that um, uh, histone acetylation and histone factors involved in acetylation signaling were super important to, to were critical to, to activate transcription after fertilization. And essentially, we also uncovered that, you know, these maternal RNA factors that are deposited by the man need to, treat, to reach to a certain level of translation in general to activate um, um, uh, the transcription for the first time in our life, okay? So, um, and that was great because we, we, we and others have figured out some of the clues about uh, the, um, how the psychotic genome is activated, but we have um, plenty of questions still, I guess. The next slide is about, I mean, you guys interrupt me in any moment. <laughs> you, you, you think it's necessary or you need to ask some questions. But the, the, the big question that I think both things, CRISPR-Cas and um, um, uh, early development converge here is to try to address this question. So, so we know few things, few factors that uh, are in zebrafish able to um, contribute to a, a, a psychotic genome activation, you know, P300, BRD, uh, among the acetylation factors, and then the pluripotency factors. But who else? That's my question. Who else is involved? actually in psychotic gene activation, you need to take into account that uh, in the off side of zebrafish, thousands of, of RNAs are deposited by the mom. 70% of the genes are represented there. So, so, and we know just a few of them that they, they have a role there. So then we were looking for a systematic system to carry out a lot of function screening, essentially getting rid out of the maternal contribution in, in, in the RNA from the mom, and then interrogate the, the embryo and then ask if any of these factors that we can now eliminate have a role in the activation of the genome. That was the, the big question. And then, and then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Miguel, like uh, understanding these, these factors and, and studying this in zebrafish, how does this, how does this help to translate into um, what you, we might understand for human development and also disease? That's a great question, actually. So, so, Early development is, is um, I'm convinced that early development is conserved in a mechanistic manner, in a functional manner. Then the, the actor and actress in the, in, the, in the movie, they can change. But at the end of the day, we are looking for not only um, particular RNAs, but also particular functions, biological functions. So, so I guess, and as, this is one of my you know, final goals, you know, to translate where we are trying to understand in a fantastic model for early development, um, which is zebrafish, I would love to translate that in, 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 in mammalian biology and, and ultimately 
human biology as well. Yeah, I think we can learn a lot of that. And also, you know, pluripotency and, and, and cell reprogramming, which can have a, an impact also in, 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 in uh, regenerative medicine and, and so on. So yeah, so the point is that um, and in principle, you can, you can think that uh, uh, carry out and screening to get rid of the, the RNA from the oocyte, just fertilized, should be easy if we, if we could use um, RNAi, right? Because that has been the tool that we have used um, over the last 20 years, almost, to, or, even, or maybe 15, to get rid out of the RNA and then ask, uh, why are you involved? However, in some organisms, as uh, RNAi is not working because uh, Argonaut is, uh, has two uh, mutations that may make the protein um, very slow cutting the RNA. And, one, and, and all the telos, most of the telos, including zebrafish and other models like a medaca, um, uh, they, they, they have those mutations. And then while microarrays is, are working properly through Argonaut in, in those systems, However, the um, uh, RNAi is not uh, properly functioning because this lack of activity of, of Argonaut, and this is a paper from David Bartel lab uh, back in 2018, that was a great uh, paper to you know, uncover why we couldn't use RNAi. So, so then the other way around, you can also think, of, okay, Miguel, you, you have done a great job with the CRISPR-Cas9 system, why you don't do mutants? You know, and then do the screen through mutants. That's, it's gonna be more expensive, you need to have much more infrastructure, and also those mutants need to be maternal and zygotic. That means that the man need to be, especially need to be maternal. So the man needs to be minus minus, uh, like in a, the, the two alleles should be a lot of functional alleles. And you know, sometimes those are lethal, and then you can raise those adult fish, and sometimes they are, um, they are not fertile. So, so then uh, it's complicated. You, you, you may do that for a couple of mutants or three mutants, but you cannot do a screen like that. It's very complicated and expensive. And then we have used morpholinos during 15 years. Uh, morpholinos are like in a, they are nucleic acids that are super stable. And you can use them um, to inhibit translation by complementarity through the, uh, the regions running the OG and the OG, or to inhibit uh, splicing sites, splicing uh, by the exon interjection and then generating loss of function of these targets. Um, we have been using in the field of uh, zebrafish and also Xenopus morpholino for a while. They have been great, but uh, we, have, we have several troubles to use them in a systematic manner because they are, they are expensive. I mean, they are not cheap and um, uh, enough to carry out the screening. Although, you know, super maybe rich, very rich laboratories can do that, but not every single laboratory in the world. And also morpholinos, uh, lastly, over the last five years, we have uncovered the community, have uncovered that they uh, generate sometimes toxicity, inducing um, um, stress and immune response. They have off targets. So you need to have many controls to be safe. So again, it's not, it's a, it's a nice tool. It's a nice tool to, to, for a couple of genes, but not for carrying out a systematic screening. So that's so, yeah. So, so I guess now you've been you, now you've turned your attention away from these uh, these tools, and now you're you're starting to look at other nucleases, right? Specifically, exactly. R, RNA editors exactly. uh, to, to knock down your RNA. Exactly. That was the so the point is that you can imagine, uh, Kevin, that I have I I have I had this idea on mine. So how we can get rid of, of the maternal contribution in a systematic manner? And there were there, there wasn't any tool at that point like, three years ago before to come, to come back to Spain to do that. And yes, in the, in the, in the, in the transition, let's say, to come back to, uh, to Spain, so Fensan again, Fensan Lab again, and Patrick Su um, Lab came out with this uh, fantastic system, Kiss for um, They Both laboratories um, uncover different uh, proteins and system, especially, uh, specifically uh, Fensan, uh, lab and cover CRISPR catheter A, B, and C, and then Patrick Sulab and cover CRISPR catheter D. And they, they showed that they were highly specific and more efficient than RNAi even in mammalian cells. So, of course, one advantage is they are not depending on the endogenous machinery, so you don't unbalance. So, you need, you need to think that every time that you uh, transfect or use RNAi, you are unbalancing 
the endogenous machine learning that can cause also off targets, not only because the off target by off target binding, right? So um, at them, but you know, at that point, uh, the reports were shown uh, only in, in mammalian cell culture and later on a little bit later on in plants. But there wasn't any data in, in animal models. And that was uh, uh, motivating us to, to me, to my laboratory and Ariel Balsini laboratory in Star Wars to try to you know, optimize now this great system in mammalian cells but in, in animal embryos. And that's what we did actually. So the other question I'm gonna ask is, um, what are some of the advantages of using Cas9, I'm oh, sorry, Cas13 approach in zebrafish? Sorry, can you repeat the question? What are some of the advantages of using Cas13 in zebrafish? Uh, so, um, I, so the, the, the advantages are that we don't have any system to eliminate RNA in zebrafish because we cannot use RNAi, for instance. And, 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 and that, with that, is uh, is just a um, super advantage. And then we have been using morpholinos. That's what I was trying to summarize in the in the in the other slide. Like in a, so, different approaches that we can have to eliminate the RNA or, or the material contribution or uh, generate knockdowns, but none of them are uh, ha has been optimized enough to carry out a systematic approach uh, to ultimately carry out uh, a functional screen, which is actually was my my main goal actually uh, to to the, carry out a functional screen to figure out um, what maternal RNAs are uh, important for early development. So. So that's why that's when I, this is a one of the super advantage if uh, the system was working and it was. <laughs> hey, hey Miguel, before we maybe before we go into how you use Cas13 um, to yeah. get RNA uh, yeah. specifically mRNA knockdown, we did have a question come through the chat uh, from Eric who asked, um, at what age of zebrafish embryos do the maternal mRNA and protein disappear? That's a great question. So that's going to depend depends on the, mater, the, the RNA and the protein. So the whole life of uh, these guys are different, but you know, a huge, I mean, this is, I'm not working actually on how the RNA is decaying after fertilization. Um, and you know, the, it's a good question about the protein because that's not that study. But for instance, my former lab, Giraldo's lab have done a, has done a fantastic job uh, characterizing the different pathways that are involved in the degradation of the maternal contribution and how um, different RNAs are decaying and what factors are actually also involved in that. So there are um, great, great uh, papers that came out past year, but you know, that's it depending on different RNAs. But you know, between six, eight hours, a great part of the maternal contribution in the case of zebrafish is, 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 is really coming down, even before. All right, so, so yes, so then what we, we did is that uh, to, um, to test the different caster team system that ha had been uh, optimized in, in the mammalian cells, but now in vivo, in an in a, in a animal model. And we, we use um, LWA caster team A, PGU um, caster team B, PSP caster team B, and then RFX caster team D, or Cas Rx is called also like that. And then among the four that we tried, that they were the most efficient one in mammalian cells, only Cas13 D was able to actually don't cause toxicity in, in zebrafish embryos and get enough um, um, activity or, or um, efficient activity to actually see a, a RNA degradation in, a, in a, an efficient manner. So here, here I'm showing you an example of that. This is a, a, a zebrafish a female, which is transgenic for RFP. So then the, the oocyte is going to be loaded in RFP messenger RNA. And then, and then we co-inject in those zebrafish embryos coming from this mom, um, three components. Uh, essentially, we uh, inject the, a messenger RNA coming from GFP as a control, then the messenger RNA coming from catheter D, and then guide RNAs um, with um, targeting the RFP messenger RNA. And then as you can see, only when we use the combo, 
uh, the, the, winning com the winning combo, which is RFX scattering D plus the gatherers for RFP, we have lack of, of, of uh, RFP um, uh, RNA, um, while the GFP is not touched, basically. So, so that was suggesting that the system was specific and, and efficient. And then on the right, I'm showing you just uh, the RNA seq that we did in, for this experiment, uh, where um, we compared injected embryos with catheter D along. As you can see, the, the, the RNAs are um, pretty similar in amount. So we quantify all of them and then we couldn't see any significant difference. And RFP in red is uh, at the same level in both conditions. But then when we compare catheter D along with catheter D plus the gallium A uh, GFP, uh, we can see the, how we um, um, uh, degrade fivefold the RFP messenger RNA, while the other um, RNAs in the embryo were uh, similar to each other in both conditions. So, so indicating that the system was working efficiently and in a specific manner. Okay, all the other uh, conditions that we see on, on, the, on the left in the, in the microscopy uh, picture uh, were not able to generate a degradation. So that was good because it was a maternal gene from a transgenic, but then we wanted to also target endogenous genes and that's the next slide, I guess. And then we, we, we were able to successfully generate lo, lo, uh, knockdown of these uh, endogenous genes expressing single fish embryos. One of them on the left is a gene called DND where, that is involved in the formation of gem cells so the lack of function of, of, of GND is, is, is going to cause a lack of germ cells. As you can see here, only when we target um, uh, uh, DND specifically and not other unrelated genes as tyrosinase, we see a lack um, of germ cells in a specific manner. And also, again, by RNA-seq, we could see that uh, the only gene that was actually uh, downregulated in these conditions was DND, DND, was eightfold down regulation by RNA seq, and the other genes in the in the in the transcriptome of these embryos were untouched, were not degraded, and then most excitingly, uh, it was to um, for us to to observe that actually we could also um, target genes that are specifically involved in the psychotic genome activation, as it is NANOG. NANOG is one of the transcriptional factors that we know now that is involved in the activation of the genome after fertilization. And then the lack of function of nano by using morpholinos because a delay in silver fish embryos and generating uh, epiboli and gastrulation defects. And we were able to recapitulate those phenotypes by using our optimized CRISPR catheter in the system um, in, from the uh, phenotypical point of view, as you can see on the, on the top panel where, you know, uh, RF, uh, catheter D along embryos and catheter D embryos plus um, uh, gallinus targeting GFP are uh, wild type, let's say, they are developing normally. And uh, the um, catheter D uh, embryos injected with catheter D and gallinus targeting nano, but they are delayed in development. And also, from the molecular point of view, we were able to recapitulate the, the, the transcriptome that we have observed before with the morpholino targeting nano by using uh, crispr catheter D. So all the genes that are uh, a significant um, uh, part of the genes that are downregulated in nano with using the morpholino, uh, in nano blossom function using the morpholino, were also downregulated using crispr catheter D in, in vivo in zero efficient risk. So in summary, I think what we can say, and, and we have done almost 20 different uh, genes. So we have tested the system in almost 20 different RNAs that are cytotically expressed, maternally deposited, uh, uh, topically injected, or, or, or coming from transgenic, as I, as I showed before. And in all of them, were, um, we were able to, 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 sh to see a, um, a, a efficient down regulation, um, strong regulation. The, the average is 80% of down regulation. It's a fast knockdown because we see that in six hours after the injection in the embryo. We don't see toxicity, uh, nor coming from the, the casting uh, uh, RNA or the guide RNAs. 
we don't see substantial of targets or collateral activity. That is something that you can observe with CRISPR catheter systems in vitro or in bacteria. And we don't see either uh, stress immune response. So, and then the system is super cheap and easy to validate by qPCR or RNA-seq, which is another advantage that uh, you compare using morpholines where the, the RNA is not degraded, so you cannot check it out by, by qPCR. So, yeah. And we were so happy with that. But then, uh, again, since we wanted to target genes that were maternally provided and have a role very early in development, in the first two, three hours, then we, we, we thought that maybe we should um, purify the protein rather than to inject the RNA coding for casertin. And then see, with that, we had a more penetrance phenotype and faster degradation of the RNA. Because at the end of the day, you inject the RNA in the embryo. Uh, then that needs to be translated. Then the protein needs to be looking for the guide RNA in, in the embryo. And here, by making the RMP in vitro and then injecting them directly in the embryo, we, we hypothesized that we could have these uh, more severe effects. Um, and by the way, we cannot inject uh, uh, DNA in zero-fish embryo. That's why we use always RNA and protein, because, I mean, we can. And we do that when we do transgenic protein, very few amount, because it's toxic for the fish. That's why we are always playing around with protein and RNA. And then uh, we do exactly that. We uh, purify the catheter D protein. Um, I, I need to mention that this catheter version that we are using is without NLS, because we need to have a degradation in the cytosome where the maternally, maternally provide uh, material is, is deposit. But we have also, of course, in the laboratory, the NLS version too. And, um, and yes, we, we, as you can see here on the top of the panel B, I have different phenotypes that we, you can find when you target um, nano. Again, this is our proof of principle gene uh, regarding cytotoxin activation. And then normally, uh, zero fish embryo development normally, most of the embryos are gonna be in shield stage, okay? Which is the white, a bar uh, that you can appreciate in all the controls on the left. So most of the embryos are gonna be in shield. However, when you use RNA uh, coding for catheter D, you can start to think, to, to see, um, you, you can start to see uh, embryo delay. So the, 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 the blocker are gonna be the bars, the more delay we have. But this delay is even stronger when you use the protein. And it's even stronger when you use the protein and uh, synthesized, chemically synthesized from Syntego, by the way, uh, um, um, uh, in Syntego. So here, the, the most uh, optimized panel is using one nanogram of uh, Syntego RNA plus three nanograms of the protein. As you can see here, is the, the second last bar. All the embryos were delayed, and 95% of them were in 50% or 30% people, which is a strong delay, OK? And then that was actually nice because in those conditions, we could figure out that actually was correlating very nicely um, um, in terms of RNA degradation. When we use the protein, we see very fast degradation in, in as fast as two hours. In two hours, we see 70, 80% of RNA is gone of nano using the protein, while using the messenger RNA, we have a 40, 35% of, of RNA uh, uh, eliminated. So, so yes, using the protein, we have now faster degradation and more penetrance phenotype, which is great to 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 do our final goal, which is the, the functional screening. Miguel, somebody asked in the in the chat here. Um, so you, you've been talking about using casertine D purified protein now. Um, along with the uh, synthetic versions of the guide RNAs, which yep. you, know, you can see seem to work uh, much more efficiently. But someone's asked about using uh, plasmids and what your experience is using plasmids in this system. Yeah, unfortunately, we cannot use do that in zero fish. I mean, we can. we can. We can inject very little amount of DNA in zero fish. Otherwise, the fish um, gets sick, actually. I think, I think it thinks that, uh, uh, it thinks that it's uh, infected with a virus or something. I'm not actually um, um, sure about uh, the, the biological reason of that right now, but I think it's that. And, um, and actually, it's, it's, it's uh, activating stress and immune response, and the, the, um, the, the fish is actually very sick. So we cannot use plasmids uh, in syrupies. That's why we use always RNA 
um, a brought in. Okay, is, that's all. Miguel, Miguel, is that true in 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 other uh, some anim, other fish models as well? And what other ones have you looked at, or, or have people looked at? Um, I guess in Medaka you cannot use um, DNA as well. I'm not convinced, but I'm almost positive of that. And um, and oh, well, you are talking about how the system is working now in other animals rather than the DNA question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was connecting with the DNA. But in, in any case, in Medaka, I think you cannot use the, uh, DNA anyway. So, but yes, we were, we were super encouraged, but you know, looking at this result in Cedarfish, we were super uh, happy. And then um, we were jumping to other animals to, to see if the system was working. We didn't do that deep analysis as we have done it with Cedarfish in other animals, but for sure we have been able to see that, for instance, in Medaka, which is another teleos that it doesn't have RNAi, active RNAi, or killifish. So we have seen that, for instance, in Medaka, if we target a gene involving eye development, which is, by the way, expressed 20 hours after fertilization. So this is a challenge because now the system need, needs, so the, the, the regions need to remain uh, a long time in the embryo to, to do the job. And actually, as you can appreciate here, the uninjected or the uh, castered in the along injected embryos were developing the eyes perfectly while the, the embryos injected with the combo containing cassette in the RNA, in this case, we are injecting the messenger RNA, and the guide RNA targeting RX3, which is the gene involved in eye development, were losing the eyes or reducing the size of the eye uh, a lot. So that's indicating that in Medaka, the system is working as well, and uh, we don't see toxicity in uh, injecting the, the, the cassette in D, so it's looking great, so maybe, you know, this is a proof of principles, uh, so people working in Medaka need to do uh, maybe some of the, of the analysis that we have done it in RNA, by RNA sake, and etc. But then killifish, we have seen something similar. Here we are targeting RFP again, having GFP as a controller is looking great. And also in mouse, uh, we have seen it um, that um, the system is working properly as well. Um, here we have uh, plenty of controls targeting with a, um, RFP, but with the different gathernades or just with the protein of uh, the gathernade alone and we don't see any depletion of RFP, only when we use the, the winner combo gathernade for RFP and gathernade, we see a depletion of RF, uh, RFP. And we have seen also in a couple of genes in mouse, endogenous genes that are involved in early development that we can also recapitulate a phenotype that has been described for, for mutants, mouse mutants, but now using crispr gathernade. So I, I know we need to move on and we, ha we have some other questions as well, but um, as, as we'll get to the end, I know some people have asked about um, uh, design and we can get to that in a minute, but um, somebody did ask about um, commercial availability of Cas13b um, and you know, uh, some people struggle to, to, to make their own Cas uh, protein in the lab versus buying it commercially. Does your lab have a protocol or is it in your, is it in your new paper? Um, exactly, or, exactly. The, protocol, the, the protocol it will be out in, in very soon. I'm not sure. I mean, the paper is in press now, so so it should be should be out very soon. But I'm happy to you know to collaborate and to share the protocol if, if you guys have um, you know uh, you want to to, to purify cassette in, the, uh, in your lab. So it's um so we we are fortunate because we have a fantastic proteomic unit in my institute and they did a very great job, also with led by one of my master students. And, um, and um, yeah, and then we purify the protein uh, and it's working great, to be honest, yeah. Okay, so um, can you tell us what you're working on now? Yeah. So now I'm super, so the lab is super excited now because we, we are now doing what we wanted to do, which is the first systematic loss and function screening on, on the maternal contribution zero fish as a model for vertebrates, let's say. No? So we have now uh, thousand, so not thousand, but hundreds of guidance coming from Sintego probably next week. <laughs> so the, and, and this is the, has been thanks to the Genome Engineering Innovation Grant that I, I got past summer. So now we have done some of the experiments and, and pro, uh, testing the synthetic uh, guidance from Sintego were done through the, the, the Genome Engineering Innovation Grant. But now we have, um, you know, order, I don't know, almost 600 uh, gatherers to target hundreds of 
uh, maternal RNAs that we think that they could be potentially involved in early development, particularly in psychogenal activation. But also, you know, in this uh, COVID-19 time, we are using the system, our RMPs, to try to tackle this little problem that we have now in the world, like which is the, 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 this COVID-19 uh, situation. So, I mean, we, this is a, absolutely a side project on the lab, but uh, we wanted to contribute a little bit to, to help to, to solve this problem. And then um, we have done like an, a, an, a nice uh, collaboration within the country with people uh, from Madrid in the CMB that are experts in CRISPR cas system as well, Chris Montoliu uh, lab, and also Dolores Aguirre lab, which is a virologist with uh, um, plenty of years of experience. And also people from the Northwest of Spain, from University of Santiago, they are doing a great job in nanotechnology. So we're trying to now uh, set up uh, conditions to actually tackle this problem of the, of the COVID uh, uh, situation um, by using crispr cas Of course, degrading the RNA of the virus and other RNA virus as well. And yes, this is it. I mean, the lab is working in crispr cas system using similar features and model. And I wanna thank to my lab on the left especially Luis, which is a um, PhD student that just came to the lab like in a few months ago, uh, like in a eight months ago, and has been working super hard in the, in the crispr cas in the papers. He's the second author of the paper. And then Ismael and, and Diana as well, and all the laboratory. And especially I would like to thank the uh, Ariel Bassini lab, which is um, um, my collaborator in this crispr cas project, and um, which is this guy of the Argentinian t-shirt, and I'm the other one playing soccer together one year ago, and especially also Gopal uh, Kushawa, which is the, the first author of the, the paper. And finally, Malaga Trillo Lab in Peru, which is collaborating and, uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, in this project as well, and Takas Lab in, from New Haven, um, all the funding, including the Genome Engineering Innovation Grant that I, that I got last year. All right, this is it. Okay, so I know, I know we also had a, lot, a very popular question that was submitted before, and also asked a lot during um, uh, your talk today in the chat, which is how you how do you design your CAS13 guides? Yeah, that's a very good question. So actually, well, back in the um, in when we started the project, there wasn't too much information about it. Uh, what we did was to um, so in the FENSAM papers, they um, show sort of a correlation between accessibility of the RNA and targeting. So, but you know, this accessibility is essentially done in, 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 in silico. So, but we have done it like that. And to be honest, it's working pretty nice. What we, ha we are doing um, to ensure good targeting is to use three, four guidelines per gene to, to, sh to, to be sure that, that we, we, if one is failing, maybe, you know, the other two are working or, you know, to in, 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 you know, increase the probabilities to have a uh, degradation. But, you know, most of the, the uh, guidelines that we have tried, they are working good, but it, still we see some variability between them. And now the Nissan Yana has, has done a fantastic job um, putting out an algorithm to predict guide RNA activity based on mammalian cell data, which is a little bit different than that we are doing because they are expressing the guide RNA from U6 promoters. And here is just uh, in vitro transcribe or synthetic that they can be uh, uh, degraded and they can have a different dynamic uh, in within an embryo, let's say. Yeah. Okay, great. So I think we don't have enough time for any more questions, but I'm sure if you submit them to us, um, we'll get what's pass them on to Miguel so he can uh, he can take a look at them um, sure. as we go through. Sure. Glad uh, to glad to answer any question. Yeah, for sure. Miguel, thank you for joining us today, and um, yeah. pretty excited about this and great research. And thank you for taking the time to share with our audience. So Kevin, yeah. I want to ask uh, who's going to be on office hours for us. Uh, coming up here. Um, yeah, so again, thanks Miguel for coming and we're really happy, much. To, we're, we're happy to take part in your work and we're, we're really excited to, when you applied for one of the uh, genome engineering grants that we did last year, so I'm happy to support that. So yep. also, we're also very excited because uh, actually Miguel, um, somebody you know is gonna be joining us in, in two weeks, a uh, pretty famous uh, person in the CRISPR world. <laughs> um, and so we're gonna be joined actually on CRISPR office hours in two weeks. Um, uh, I think if you go to the next slide here by Dr. Jennifer Dalda. So um, she's obviously uh, uh, pretty well known in the CRISPR world. So uh, <laughs> we're very we're very excited to have Jennifer come on. Um, and she's gonna be talking to us about 
um, how her lab, even though uh, we're going through a pandemic, has actually just um, uh, published on a new uh, cast nuclease, um, but also the fact that um, uh, the uh, Innovative Genomics Institute, where she works, has been turned into a COVID-19 testing center. And she's also taking part, uh, of course, doing many things that she always does um, uh, in a development of several new diagnostics for COVID-19. So it should be a, a pretty exciting chat with Jennifer. Yeah, definitely. Don't miss it. I will not. <laughs> oh, we're pretty excited by it, too. And just a reminder, it's in two weeks, August 6th at 10 a.m. So we're pretty excited to have her um, be there and talk through the various activities she's doing, as Kevin said. So with that in mind, I want to wrap it up. And if you go to synthego.com slash com to get your shirt, keep calm and crisper on. This is where you can fill out the form and our shirts are shipping. And so if you fill it out, we will be making sure to get those over to you. And with All that, right. well, thank you again, Miguel. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks everybody. And Miguel, thanks again for your time and uh, staying up with us this evening and enjoy your evening in Spain. Um, <laughs> thank you. Go have thank some you. sangria and uh, we'll see everybody <laughs> in a, we'll see everyone in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Right. See you guys. Thank you very much.